Welcome. My name is Jonathan Coppell. I'm Dean of the College of Public Service and Community Solutions, and this is our third version of our Public Service Impact Talks. I'm really excited about these talks because one of the, one of the things they do, which we don't actually get much of a chance to, uh, to offer, is, a chance, is an opportunity for people to hear a little bit more about what our faculty what our faculty are actually doing and what their research is about and how they are serving the mission of the college, which is to address the most pressing issues in our community and figure out what are solutions to these challenges. As I've talked about in previous gatherings, we changed the name of the college. We are the college formerly known as the College of Public Programs, but we changed the name of the college to be reflective of our mission, which is to address um, to address challenges and come up with solutions. One of them is by training our students at the undergraduate, master's, and doctoral level to be engaged in public service, hence the public service part. And the solutions part is about finding answers to these challenges. The last, uh, or the first one of these gatherings, we heard from uh, several members of our School of Social Work faculty. And I have to apologize, I can't stick with you because we have a School of Social Work gathering uh, across the street that I'm going to go to. Um, but that covered a broad range of issues, uh, talked about uh, Dr. Carney's uh, uh, research on domestic violence, uh, Dominique Grosepowitz talked about her work on human trafficking, and Joanne Cacciatore uh, talked about her work on working, uh, working with families um, grieving the loss of a child. So a broad range of subjects, just three, three of the faculty members in the School of Social Work. Uh, subsequently, we had a set of talks that were around the Super Bowl. Um, so David Swindell in the School of Public Affairs talked about financing sports facilities and some of the dilemmas of municipalities investing in sports. Uh, Scott Decker, while well, he was scheduled to, it didn't actually happen, but was scheduled to talk about gangs and the interaction between professional sports and gangs. And the third one, Mary Feeney. And Mary Feeney, uh, another professor in the School of Public Affairs, talked about the NFL as a nonprofit organization. Actually, you might have heard, you might have heard her on the radio talking about this topic because there was some attention to the fact that the the president of a nonprofit organization makes eight gajillion dollars a year. Um, Forty-four. What was it? Forty-four. Forty-four million dollars a year. Um, so tonight um, we're hearing from uh, three representatives of the School of Community Resources and Development. School of Community Resources and Development and uh, its director Kathy Andrek will be your host uh, following my departure. Uh, is perhaps the most varied school in the college. It covers a broad range of subjects, um, including parks and recreation, nonprofit leadership and management, um, and tourism. Uh, and so you're going to get a flavor for that. You're going to get a flavor for that tonight uh, through two faculty members and one outstanding doctoral student. I wanted to make a point, and this is going to make a very elegant segue, uh, very elegant segue to the first speaker, a welcoming uh, many uh, members of the ASU Emeritus College who participate in the college's art uh, advocacy and, uh, program. So over in the UCED building, we have the benefit of having terrific art produced by our ASU Emeritus artists, as well as artists from the community. And the purpose of this art program, which was created by my predecessor, Deborah Friedman, was to use art uh, as a mechanism to build community. It was also to do something with the acres of blank walls in the USAP building, but it was really about building community. Um, but I was just speaking about this uh, at a reception for our artists. It really is one of the most powerful aspects of art, that it can bring people together, it creates exchange of ideas, it creates dialogue. Um, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing force, and we don't often appreciate art in that level, and as you can imagine, in the School of Community Development, uh, Art is a subject that uh, that comes up, and the power of art to build a community comes up. And so, our first speaker, Tiffany Ord, is a second year. Second year? Mm -hmm. How can you already have a job? Your second year. <laughs> a second year, a second year doctoral student in the program, who is going to give a talk about her work on art as a community building instrument in refugee camps. And I, I'm, I was, I would pretend to remember the name, but I'm going to mess it up. In the Sarawi, 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 
Sahrawi refugee camp in the west. Uh, that's in the Western Sahara, right? Uh, and so uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, connection. We just come from talking about art building community uh, in our college and here in Phoenix, and Tiffany's going to talk about art building community in the context of a refugee uh, a refugee camp uh, in Africa. So. Thank you so much for participating in this event. I'm, uh, I'm extremely excited to welcome you here. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I wish that more people get to see what I get to see as dean of the college, which is the amazing work that our individual faculty members and students are doing. Unfortunately, not enough of that gets to the community. So this is a window into what we do, and uh, very excited that you're here to share this with us. And I, again, I apologize that I'm going to have to step out midway through, but I'm sure you're going to have a you're going to have an excellent time. And after Tiffany, you're going to hear from Christine Bozinda and Dave White, two of our superstar our superstar faculty members. Christine's going to be talking about tourism and the way in which we as tourists can make a contribution to the communities we visit. And Dave's going to talk about what we do in Arizona when all the water runs out. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, enjoy the evening, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at future installments of these talks, which we expect the next one will be forthcoming in September. Um, and I think, I think criminology, you guys are on. You guys are probably on top. So <laughs> get ready. Uh, very good. Welcome, and uh, I'll see you at the end of the show. Bye. Very much. That was a wonderful segue into speaking about arts for community building and activism. And today we're going to be talking about arts and culture based activism in the Sahrawi refugee camps in southwestern Algeria. So, of course, that uh, we have a very small time together today. I could probably talk about this for many hours, uh, so I'll probably be using my nose here or there to stay on track as I uh, did a talk at the local, the Global Justice Festival a few weeks ago. It was an hour and a half long, and at the very end of it, I still had 32 slides left. <laughs> so I won't do that to you here today. But um, So we'll just kind of try to go quickly. And uh, today we're going to talk about who are the Sahrawi? Uh, why is arts and culture-based uh, activism being utilized? What's the need? What are the strategies being employed? And then the impacts to the community and the cause. So let's start off with where we are geographically in the world, where we're talking about. We're talking about the Western Sahara, which is located in northern Africa. You will note that most maps that you will see of Africa, that this section is usually gray. The reason for that is because it's a, an area that is under dispute, and it's very difficult for external organizations, journalists, nonprofits, to actually access this territory and monitor human rights and things of that nature. So many times it is a gray area on the map. So regionally, just looking at the Western Sahara, you will see that the purple area is the Moroccan occupied territory, and the kind of goldy beige is the Polisario held territory. The Polisario is the uh, government in exile for the Sahrawi people, the representative government. And um, before I get back to the map of explaining what that blue thing is in the middle that might look like a river, is just to, to briefly go over a little bit of the history of the conflict. Again, it's a very complex, highly contested um, history, and there are multiple viewpoints to be had, both on the Kingdom of Morocco side, as well as the Polisario Front, Martinia. There are many, in Spain, that was the colonizing power. So I'm not going to get into a lot of that history, but I do encourage you to very much do your own exploration and look at the history for yourself. I can provide some resources afterward. Um, if anyone wants to see just a short YouTube video that shows a very uh, short and sweet, if you can um, call it that, uh, overview of the conflict. So when Spain left the Spanish um, Western Sahara, as it was called at the time in the 70s, they, um, under pressure to decolonize, then Morocco and Mauritania both came in, Morocco from the north, Mauritania from the south, to take over that uh, geographic area of the Western Sahara. There were already tribal and nomadic peoples living there, called the Sahrawi, and um, so this started a war, and eventually Mauritania pulled out, but uh, Morocco and the Polisario continued to fight for almost two decades. 
And um, also, while the, the Sahrawi people were um, being driven out of this territory, napalm and white phosphorus were utilized on them. And so many people fled out to the open desert of Algeria to where they are this day, 40 years later, in long-term refugee camps. And then many stayed behind in the what they termed to be the occupied zone. So back to this map, this blue area in the middle is actually a 4,200 kilometer long berm, earthen berm called the wall, that is um, covered with active landmines and uh, Moroccan troops. And so over the past 40 years, those people that were um, either chose to flee into the desert that now live in the refugee camps, or those that chose to stay in the occupied territory of Morocco, administered by Morocco, have, uh, many have not seen each other for 40 years. So many families were separated during this time. So who are the Sahrawi? They speak a sub-dialect of Arabic, a very unique sub-dialect of Arabic called Hassaniya. And um, it is a very complex and regional hybrid of an identity. But um, Sahrawi very much means people of the Sahara Desert. So the human rights aspect of this is very important to understand. In October, from October, October to November of 2010, something very important happened, was um, this uh, Gadim Azik. If anyone has heard of the, the camp that was set up by Sahrawi in the occupied zone of Morocco for um, about a month, month and a half. Um, it was then very aggressively uh, dismantled, and there were many people that were injured and hurt during this time. And um, Noam Chomsky has repeatedly said that he felt that this was the true beginning of the Arab Spring. And um, the human rights within the territory of the Western Sahara. Again, I would encourage you to go to Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, as they have very full and detailed reports on the human rights situation still going on there today. So why did I become involved in uh, this refugee camp in southwest Algeria that I didn't even know existed up until that point? When I spoke to a friend of mine, I actually went to Morocco in 2012 and was extremely deeply and profoundly connected to the Sahara Desert, something I still cannot explain, but if we ever have coffee sometime, I'll share my travel experiences with you. It was phenomenal. Um, but I, I love the people. I love the place. And so later when I was telling a friend of mine about how spectacular Morocco was, she then went on an educational trip there, learned of RT Fariti, and shared that information with me. And I was, I was floored. I had no idea what was happening. Um, I was like most other um, Americans in that I had no clue that this 40-year-old conflict was still happening. And so I uh, went to these, the uh, RT Fariti Arts Festival in November of 2013 to do some exploratory research. And this is a view outside of our Haima, which is a desert tent where we stayed with a host family in Camp Bouche d'Or. And as you can see, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, poverty in the refugee camps and they don't have a lot of, um, they don't have running water, not much electricity, a lot of malnutrition. They rely exclusively on international aid for both food and water. And the desert conditions are very harsh. It's very cold at night, very hot in the summer, and they're exposed to extreme conditions. And so the Polisario government, um, after having conflict with Morocco, active conflict for almost two decades, there was a peace treaty signed in 1991 with the understanding that there would be a referendum that the Sahrawi people could vote uh, for their self-determination. Were they going to stay under the administrative control of, of Morocco, or did they want to look at the option of having a sovereign nation or some other option? So a vote uh, was promised by this referendum for the peace treaty in 1991. And then nothing has really ever happened with that. And again, you could do, do your own research for the reasons why that, that is still so. But to this day, there's still no vote. Um, so the people are still <coughs> fighting for their self-determination, for the right to vote. And um, so what they, the, the government did, they decided to get the help of international NGOs, international activists, academics, and others to support an arts and culture-based strategy 
for activism instead of picking up arms or continuing to fight. And so they, it's a collective action against what they call the blue wall that I showed you they call the wall of shame that fractures Western Sahara in two, separating Sahrawi families between occupation and exile. These and uh, their annual encounters are a tool to reclaim the rights of individuals and peoples to their land, their culture, their roots, and their freedom. And so this is just an example of some pictures that I took during the uh, festival. This is an art training that is going on, a uh, collaboration between international artists and artists there in the camp. There were a variety of arts that, that took place during the week. Uh, visual arts, there were painting, uh, sculpture, um, many, many different things happened. Music, um, art was also used as remembrance because over the 40 years, there have been countless that have been disappeared or um, detained in prisons and not heard from again, so their family members are never really sure what happened to them. And so um, art is also a way that the community can then work with international artists that come into the camp to do drawings of their family members <coughs> as they have no pictures of them. And this is one project with a group I'm actually now affiliated with called Arts Action Group, where we um, went into the primary school in the refugee camp and used art to examine issues surrounding access to clean water. And we also brought some water packs that, when you put the water into the water pack, that um, it's sterilized and they're able to carry it. And, and there were some other water-related projects that happened. And this all came from our exposure through attending rt 4 t so also during the RT Free Tea Festival, there are many different educational sessions. This one here um, highlights an international human rights lawyer that was instrumental in the East Timor case. And he states that East Timor and Western Sahara are like two drops of water, that the situation is so similar to one another. East Timor has actually uh, realized its self-determination. Western Sahara has not gotten to that point yet. But he was there to give an overview of what he did in East Timor, try to help build strategies, political strategies, with the people there in the camps. There was also a professor from New York University that gave a lecture on uh, self-determination movements, utilizing arts and self-determination movements. So it was a, there's a very large component of education that also works with uh, this art activism. So this is another project that came out of RT Fariti. It is called Sahara Libre Wear, which is high-end resistance fashion. And I was lucky enough to be um, voluntold to be a part of the fashion show, which was so humiliating. Um, I will not show you the video. But um, so that they, they're screen printing there in the camps. Uh, the women uh, make a lot of the designs, and it's meant to honor their traditional designs, like the melfa, the traditional women's dress that they wear, but to do it more in kind of an impactful way with resistance type slogans and whatnot. You can see there a boy that he's walking on the, the runway uh, during the, this uh, fashion show. Another project that has come from uh, Arts Action Group and in uh, conjunction with Adelphi University is called Shared Roots. And it is a project to help people, being that there's, there's no video and audio equipment there in the camps, is to help them document their oral history. Traditionally, they're very oral, um, nomadic, and tribal peoples. And so um, for the past 40 years, they've been in these refugee camps. So cultural knowledge loss is extremely, extremely important to them because the elders who live the traditional nomadic lifestyle out in the open desert, they pass their um, traditional ecological cultural knowledge through stories and through, through proverbs and through poetry to one another. Well, since that, that lifestyle is no longer now able to take place because the Western Sahara is fractured by not only a wall, but active landmines and things of that nature, um, the younger people who have been living in the refugee camps for the past 40 years have absolutely no clue what it's like to live in that way. And so they feel like their traditional cultural knowledge is really being lost as the older generation passes away. So this is a, um, a project to document that oral history. 
There's a lot of internal and external involvement. Many of the nonprofit organizations that are part of this are Spanish, or um, there's one from the UK that I'm familiar with. Our uh, arts action group is based in New York. But there's also, so that's kind of talking about RT for ET, the arts festival. There is also, again, Samara Libreware, which is fashion. There is Sandblast, which is a music studio. There is uh, Fee Sahara, which is a film festival that I will be attending next week. And they have also built, and, and this shows, I think, the commitment to utilizing arts, is they have built an art school, a music school, and a film school there in the refugee camps to help uh, teach young people these different um, uh, tools. And, and that is a good point as well, is even though the ability to use art to express themselves is very much a positive, it is a strategic tool in activism. That is the reason. Um, and then there are other forms of art in the camp, ceramics, theater, and things of that nature. So again, I'll be going to the Sahara, uh, the Fee Sahara Film Festival next week in Camp Dakla, and it is termed the world's most remote film festival. <laughs> so I am extremely excited and intrigued to be able to go and do that, and I hope to continue my research there and looking at how culture and arts are being used to not only build community, but for activism. So uh, I have a privilege of standing here before you today. I have a privilege of obtaining education. I have access. And I have the ability to talk with you t tonight. But this is not my story. This is the, the story of the Sahara people. And so I contacted my dear friend, translator, and very talented artist, um, Mohammed. And he is a, a calligrapher. He does poetry. He's a photographer, an amazing artist who's lived in the camps his entire life. And I asked him to take a look at my presentation and tell me what he thought about it. Um, this goes a little bit into the community-based research that I hope to do for the remainder of my career. And this is what he had to say, and I kind of broke it up into some themes. Art for Empowerment um, looks at connection, shared meaning, and strengthening community. He said, art engages people on a different level. It helps to keep the Sahrawi identity alive, communicates this message to the world and humanity, we learn from others and share with them. Through arts and culture, we have expressed our will, but it has also strengthened our community. And then looking at agency and empowerment, viewing themselves as active and not passive, he says, through music, poetry, um, oral history, I hope we can change our image of being simply refugees, looked at as castaways into the desert, disconnected, a passive people that things are being done to. Yes, I'm a refugee, but I'm building something. I'm creating. So there is a lot of hardship, but there is still continued hope. He says, art can use the little that we have to create something beautiful and useful. If you just live as a refugee, if you don't have meaning to your life, it could be very easy to lose hope and get discouraged. It has been 40 years, not days, weeks, or months, but 40 years. It is not easy to believe that art can, believe, can bring the change that you want. It is not easy to keep people waiting for a resolution, but still people try to express themselves, to communicate. They still believe in nonviolence and peaceful expression. And then at the festival, it isn't like everyone's daily life. You actually get someone to listen to you, and that doesn't happen very often. And so the real question here is, does it make a difference? You know, arts and culture, they're utilized for many different things in community building and community development and activism, but does it really work? So, due to the media surrounding this event, I had the opportunity to speak with the U.S. Ambassador to the Western Sahara, representing the Polisario Front. That was a nerve-wracking phone call um, yesterday morning. And so I was like, hello, Ambassador. Okay, so it was a very uh, interesting experience, but I had the opportunity to ask him as well what he thought and if there was actually an impact. And what he had to say was that people had went through armed struggle for 18 years. It's been peaceful for 24 years since 1991, but we have found that arts and culture are more powerful, a more powerful tool than arms and violence. I think that is such an amazing statement. 
And he cited things um, like, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the documentary by Javier, Bar uh, Javier Bardem. He came to Pisahara a few years ago and then created Sons of the Clouds. Um, then there was also uh, a lot of um, press due to some Americans coming to RT3T a couple of years ago. So these are just some, some very important things that he noted to start educating not only Americans but the world about the Saharawi uh, cause. And so I will just leave you with the thoughts of exploring more for yourselves about what is happening with arts and culture in the Western Sahara. And as a nonviolent expression of creativity, community building, and activism for the Sahara people. Thank you very much.